expanding to Joel chapter 2. And we're going we're gonna to go off the beaten path, if you will, this morning from the sermon I've been preaching. And I felt like this morning this is a word from the Lord for someone here this morning. I attempted to preach this a few months ago and the Lord moved in on the service and he preaches better than I can at any time. And so I felt like this is a word for someone this morning. And so we're going we're gonna to follow the Holy Spirit. As you're turning to Joel chapter 2 and verse 15, I want to say this morning what an absolute honor it is to have my mother in service this morning sitting here on the front row with me. The Lord took care of her a few months ago. She is, she is hard-headed, and none of the rest of the family got that. <laughs> she had a heart attack on a Sunday and, and, um, and did not go to the doctor to the following Friday. And uh, when we, I, I made it from here to, to Little Rock in just a little over an hour, <laughs> we, went, we go by grace and not by law. And uh, we walked in the, the hospital room there, and the surgeon walked in, and he looked at her, and he said, Lady, you ought to be dead. He said, But the Lord. He, this, was an, this is an African-American surgeon, and it's fine. He said, But the Lord took care of you. <laughs> Ooh, thank God. Amen. One of my other sisters said to him, what, well, What's going to go on? What's going to happen? Or whatever. And he said, He put his hands up, and he said, Lady... He said, these are the hands of the Lord. He said, he'll guide them and take care of your mama. And he took care of my mama, amen. And so we're so honored to have her here, my sister standing beside her, uh, and nieces and nephews, a few others that are here. And thank you so much for making the trip up here. My sister uh, drove all the way from Wisconsin this morning to hear me. That's, she's starving to death. Joel chapter 2, verse 15 through 27, the Bible said, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast and call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and let the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porches of the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. That the nations, I'm sorry, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Then let then the Lord will be zealous for his hand, for his land, and pity upon his people. The Lord will answer and say to his, his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a, repro a reproach among the nations. But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face towards the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O lamb, be glad and rejoice because, he, before, because the Lord has done marvelous things. Let me read that again. Verse 21, fear not, O lamb, because be glad and rejoice, for he has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beast of the field, for the open pastures are spring, springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. How many of you know God's going to take care of you? Amen. Verse 24, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. Verse 25, here's where I want to focus this morning. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I send among you. What the Lord is saying there is, is that he has a repayment calendar and you are on his repayment calendar for the years the enemy's stolen from you. Come on, somebody, anybody, the enemy's stolen from you, he's taken your money, 
He's taken your health. He's taken your marriage. He's taken your children. Come on, he's taken your neighbors. He's taken your home. But the Lord said there in verse 25, I will restore to you everything the devil has taken from you. Verse 26, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I the Lord your God, I am the Lord your God and there is no other and my people shall never be put to shame. Would you lift your hands and call with me on the name of the Lord this morning. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word and for your promise. You said, Lord, that you will repay the years that the enemy has stolen from us. Today is payment day for somebody in this house. I said today is repayment day for somebody in this house. Lord, let the words that would come from my mouth this morning not be my own and we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory and everybody said. God bless you as you're seated. If it would be all right, I'm just gonna preach to you this morning for a little bit and I wanna preach to you from the subject, the God of what's left. He is the God of what's left. You may be down to nothing this morning. You may be down to your last check. You may be down to your last penny. You may be down to your last doctor's visit, but let me tell you, he's the God of what's left this morning. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me set this up for you for a few moments this morning, and I want you to know that I am very much aware this morning of the context of the passage of this scripture. The prophet Joel is speaking this prophecy to Judah in a time of national crisis, in a time of moral decline, and in a time of economic and worldwide crisis. Sounds like the world that we are living in today. I said it sounds like the world we're living in today. Listen, there's not just problems happening halfway around the world, there's problems at our front door today. I said there's not problems across the sea, there's problems in America today. And let me tell you, if God spoke through the prophet of Joel, he will still use his prophets to encourage you today. Can you say amen? The prophet admonishes his nation and the children of God to turn to turn back to God into repentance. And let me tell you, that's not my the subject of my sermon this morning repentance but in these last days it's time for the church and the people that call him Lord to return to repentance to return to an old fashioned altar come on somebody not not behind, not an altar behind our steering wheel when we're going to work and not an altar at the supper table at night but a time that the church returns to a place of repentance can you say amen to that he declares that if they are willing to do so that Jehovah will restore to them everything the enemy has stolen with interest. The Lord said, the prophet said there in the scripture that I just read to you, that if the people will return to repentance, if they'll come back to an old fashioned altar and declare repentance, that the Lord will return to them everything that the enemy has stolen from them with interest. How many of you would like double for your trouble today? One, two, three. How many of you would like double for your trouble today? Interestingly enough, this prophet found its fulfillment, this prophecy found its fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. If you go back and study, you'll see that this prophecy came to fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. The point I want to make here and then we'll move on is this, that the people of Judah were supposed to be the worshipers. They were supposed to be the people. If you go back and study Judah, the people there, they were to be the worshipers. And let me tell you this morning that worshipers have the ability to connect to God quicker than others do. I said those that come to worship this morning, not those that came for a concert, but those that came this morning to worship the Lord God Almighty. Come on, if he's done anything for you, you ought to give him your worship. I said, if he's done anything for you this morning, you ought to be able to say, thank you, Jesus, for two eyes to see with, and thank you, Lord, for a vehicle. I didn't have to walk here today. Thank you, Jesus, for air conditioning. You took care of me. Thank you for a warm, dry place to sleep. I said, worship Worshippers have the ability to connect to God faster. 
When we are worshipers in this church is a worshipful church. But when we come to church, what God is looking for is not your bank account. He's not looking for your, for your good looks. Praise the Lord. Pastor Gary said amen. He's not looking for all your education. When you step in this door and we begin to sing, what he's looking for is your worship. He created you today to be worshipful. I said he created you today to be worshipful. And when you worship, you have the ability to connect to God. Well, pastor, I don't hear the voice of God. I don't, I'm not able to, I don't act like, I don't feel like. Pastor Gary, he jumps around. Others, they take off running. I don't feel like that. Well, you ought to check your worship. Are you connecting to God? Worshipers have the ability to connect to him. Why is it that true worshipers seem to get closer to God than anyone else? It's because they know how to go beyond seeking the hand of God to knowing the heart of God. I said true worshipers have the ability to connect to God because they go beyond seeking the hand of God to knowing the heart of God. And when I know the heart of God, I know he's gonna take care of everything I have need of. Come on, somebody. I didn't come here, we didn't come here today with a wish list to say, Lord, I need my bills paid. I need this done because I understand that when we connect with the heart of God, he's my father and he's your father and he's gonna take Take care of every single need that you have today because that's his heart. God made known his acts, the scripture said. God made known his acts to the children of Israel, but he made known his ways to Moses because Moses connected to the heart of God. When someone is permitted to know the heart of God, he automatically receives everything he needs from the hand of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me read it to you again. These are the words of Jesus. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Listen, if the church will return with a heart of repentance, and Lord, what is your will for my life? Lord, what do you want from me? It should go without saying that worshipers have a better chance at receiving God's best. Those that come with an attitude of of worship, they receive God's best because they understand the heart of God. Even though the children of Israel were natural worshipers, they had allowed the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in their lives and leave them in a position of poverty and spiritual decay. Listen to me today. Don't think I'm just preaching today to those that sing. I'm preaching to every person in the room today because deep down on the inside, there's a worshiper in every single person under the sound of my voice. If God's ever done anything for you today, there's a worshiper on the inside of you today. But listen, life at time just happens. I said life at times just happens happens. It happens to the worshipers. It happens to the Christians. It happens to the folks that just got here today. It happens where there are difficult times in life. A lot of the people that we dealt with yesterday, they were down. There were people that came to me that said, you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand what you're doing today. We did not have the money to send our kids back to school. It was time and time again yesterday. They would say, we have prayed. We have sought God. We have a church. Uh, Praise God for our church. But we have just fallen on difficult times. Listen, difficult things happen to every single person on the face of the earth. The Bible said it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. But let me tell you, at the end of this day, he's still God. I said he's still God. Whether today you got bad news from the doctor or you got bad news from the lawyer or you got bad news from your banker or you got bad news from your marriage counselor, let me tell you today, at the end of this day, he's still sitting on the throne and everything is still going according to his plan. He's still God. 
There's difficult things that happen to every single one of us. The picture that I'm painting for you here this morning, and I'll move on to point number one. The picture that I'm painting for you here this morning and that this prophet painted for you in this scripture was the condition of the people of Judah. And it is alarming to say the least that here are the worshipers and now here they are living defeated. Let me tell you, God never never designed you and never intended for you to live a defeated, depressed life. I, got, I said God never intended for you to be the defeated. He intended for you to be the victorious. Come on, tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say you're a winner. God intended for you to be a winner. He never intended for you to... The amazing thing is that though people had walked away from the Lord, the Lord still had not forsaken them. I don't have time to preach all of this this morning. I hope maybe you'll go back home and read it. The amazing thing when you read through this scripture is that though the people had walked away from their worship, though the people had backed off, though the people had turned away from God, he had not forsaken them. Let me tell you this morning, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 said, he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what's going on in your life this morning, he's still there. I said he's still there. Pay attention this morning, and we'll move quick as we can. Pay attention to the quotation marks in the verse that I just read to you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Pay attention to the quotation marks there in that verse because the writer of Hebrews is not speaking of himself. He is quoting exactly the words of God when God said, though you may be down to nothing, though you may be out of everything, though you may be down to your last dollar, though you may be down to your last bit of joy, though you... Are y'all with me this morning? I know we're tired. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's the God of what's left. Let me tell you point number one this morning. The enemy is bent on destruction. If you're taking notes, the enemy is bent on destruction. That's his job. His job is to come and take what God has done for you. His job is to come and take what the the Lord has done in your life. His job is to come and take your testimony, and it makes him no difference how he does that. The enemy is built bent on destruction. In case there's any doubt, In anyone's mind this morning, let me me set the record straight in your life this morning. God wants you blessed and the enemy wants you cursed. I said God wants you blessed and the enemy wants you cursed. I'm going to say it to you, clap. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be delivered. He wants you to be joyful. He doesn't want you moping around in depression. He wants you to be able this morning to walk in this sanctuary and say though the enemy may come against me my God be for me though no weapon formed against me shall prosper that all hell may break loose in my life but God will stand up for me somebody ought to say amen though the enemy comes knocking on my door God is on my side though cancer comes knocking on the door God is on my side though heart problems come into my family God is on my side somebody better get a hold of this this morning and say amen I said God is for you this morning I said he wants you blessed those that will you ought to say he wants me blessed I'm highly favored I'm going to preach to you where you sit there and look at me or not I'm highly favored my name is written in the Lamb's book of life honey this isn't my home I'm just simply passing through I'm on Woo, I'm on my way. I said, I'm this, I'm, whew, this is just practicing for what's coming. Woo, if you're visiting today, this makes you nervous. We'll be all right. Hold on, we'll come back. We'll come back. We're just Pentecostal people. We believe God's for us. He's still in the business of salvation. He's still in the business of deliverance. He's still in the business of healing. He's still in the business of taking something that's nothing and making something out of it. God is for you. You 
It's a shame that we can sit in a service like this and some still don't believe it. Well, pastor, it don't appear he's for me. Behind on my bills. Lost my Cadillac, now I got a moped. Well, let's see, are you a giver, or are you a tither, or are you a taker? I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to. All you're doing, you're after our money. No, I'm not after your money. God will save one of those folks yesterday that was here this drop dead broke and we gave them a package of paper. He'll cause them to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he'll bless them to the point to where they'll want to repay what God has done in their life. It's not about taking from you. It's about giving to God. I said it's about giving to God what's already his. The enemy and God, they are two opposing views. They are two opposite agendas. They are two very different results, and the consequences are very different. With the people of Judah, the enemy had totally decimated them. He had taken them to new lows and accosted them at every level. The people, they were the people of God. They were the worshipers. They were the church. God's promise to Judah was that he would bless them with what was left. I said this was the church people. These were the worshipers that the enemy had come in to try to take what they had. And God's promise was that I'll bless what's left. If you'll just give me what's left, you may say, Pastor, I don't have any worship. Yeah, if you can just say, thank you, Jesus, he'll bless just what you got left. If you got a dollar, listen to me, if you got a dollar left, He'll bless what you got left. If you can say thank you, Jesus. Just because we were raised in church and have a lengthy spiritual genealogy doesn't mean we are exempt to falling into the traps of the enemy. Say that to you again. Just because we're raised in the church just because this may have been your home all your life or maybe you're visiting today here and you have a church that you've been in just because you were raised in church and you have a lengthy spiritual genealogy doesn't mean that we are exempt to falling into the traps of the enemy. But let me tell you, he's a God of grace today. I said he's a God of mercy and he's a God of grace and I know what I'm talking to you about. I didn't know I would preach this today till last night and didn't really know that she would be here exactly till this morning. I, she had told me she was coming, but things happened. Her grandmother was one of the 19, first 19 charter members of the First Assembly of God Church ever. In Malvern, Arkansas, her grandmother was one of 19. Her grandmother was in that church. Her mother was in that church. My mother was in that church. We have been in that church. And let me tell you, just because we come from the very first Assembly of God church, that doesn't make us exempt from the enemy's hit list. Just because today you've been on the board for 40 years or you may be able to speak in tongues today, that doesn't make you exempt from the enemy's hit list. It only moves you you up on it, baby, because you become a threat. I said when you realize what God has done for you and you become a worshiper and you say, come hell or high water, my house for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm going to follow God. Just because we've been in church, doesn't mean that the enemy is going to slack up on his. The lives of the worshipers of Judah, they were in a sad state of disrepair. The enemy appeared to be winning the war. I said the enemy appeared to be winning the war. 
He had come and he had taken their joy. He had come and taken their worship. He had come and taken those things from them. And they appear to be in total despair. But the enemy left one thing. He left the thing that's greater that was in them than he that's in the world. The enemy may have come and taken everything from you. But there's one more thing left, baby. It's the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you. And he may have taken your house. He may have taken your children. He may have taken your health. He may be there knocking on the door to take your money. But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I said he's the God of what's left. The agenda of the enemy is very clear. You read your Bible? John chapter 10, verse 10. The, enemy, the enemy's agenda is very clear. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his agenda. No one in this room or no one watching us around the world today are exempt from the enemy's hit list. If everything is going okay today, I'm not speaking this over you. But trust me, there's a board meeting in hell this morning that they're fig- trying to figure out how they, can do, how they can conquer you in the morning, how they can conquer you when you walk out of here. But when I understand what the writer of Hebrews said, though... The- <laughs> what Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. I got to move on to get to the point. Even though the enemy may have brought all kinds of difficulty into your life, and even though the enemy had brought all kinds of difficulty into Judah's life, the constant activity of God in the life of the believer is rescue for you today. Let me say it again. Today, you may be here struggling. And this sermon may be only for just a few. And if it's for a few, that's fine. The enemy may have brought all kind of difficulty into your life. And the con- but the constant activity of God in your life, the constant pursuit of God will be your rescue if you'll just hold on. Trust me, we may feel that, the, that we have squandered every opportunity that we've been afforded. But he is the God of what's left. I said we may feel today that we have squandered every opportunity. But I want you to know this morning that he is the God of what's left. We understand this morning that the enemy is bent on destruction. Number two, the enemy is bent on destruction, but God is bent on restoration. I said, the enemy is bent on destruction, but God is bent on restoration. Let me tell you this morning, the entire agenda of God is a process of redemption. I said, the entire agenda of God is a process of redemption. The moment Adam sinned, God wrote out a plan of redemption. Adam's fall may may have caught Adam off guard. It may have caught him by surprise, but it did not catch God by surprise. I said Adam's fall may have tripped Adam up, but it did not trip God up. And let me tell you, your difficulty that you may be facing here today, no matter what it is, may have caught you off guard, but it has never caught God off guard. He has a way. I said he has a way of escape for you this morning. No matter what you're facing, I said God doesn't need plan B because he's still sticking with plan A. God doesn't need plan C. Somebody said to me yesterday, Pastor, what are we going to do if it rains? We're going to continue to do, I said, just what we plan to do. Just because the enemy may have showed up in your life uh, doesn't mean God is caught off guard. He's going to continue to do what he set out to do. And that was to bring deliverance and redemption Throughout the Old Testament, God was offering restoration to sinful people. And throughout the New Testament, we see that God is our Savior and offers mercy and grace. If you are in any doubt about God's motives for your life, let me settle it for you today once and for all. John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
I said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If you're here this morning, you're a guest or you're, this is your first time or second time. Maybe you're here from the health fair yesterday. Let me tell you, just because you may be struggling and just because difficulties may be going on, that doesn't mean it's the end of your life, honey. Today can be the beginning of your life. He's a God of reconstruction. He's a God of restoration. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... Come on, I'm a whosoever. Are you a whosoever? That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. But is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The intentions of God are unmistakable with regard to Judah. And with regard to you this morning, he's the God of what's left. I said God's intentions, God's intentions this morning were unmistakable with Judah. But they, today they're unmistakable with you as well. Pastor, I don't know if I believe what you're saying this morning. It's been so long. I've been waiting so long. Anybody just been waiting, you'll be honest. I've been waiting on God. Just me. Me and her. I'm waiting on God to show up. I'm waiting on God to answer my prayer. And the scripture there in Second Peter said, Second Peter said, the Lord isn't, isn't slack. Meaning the Lord isn't behind. The Lord isn't behind on his promise to you. Everything's going according to plan. Well, he hadn't answered my prayer yet. One thing I learned going through school, and praise God my mom's here. She can attest I made it through school. Barely. What are you laughing about? Some of you just did too, barely. Let me go back. I can't get rid of this. You may be sitting here today. He hadn't answered my prayer. I don't feel what you feel. I don't, I don't even get what you're preaching today. That's exactly the design and the trick of the enemy in your life is to give up on what works. I said to give up on what works. The intentions of God are unmistakable. He wants to make something out of what's left. But here's the thing. And it will happen all around the world today. And it will happen in this church in just a minute. We have needs, we have problems, we have difficulties. Be, but because there's such a spirit of pride in this country, there's such a spirit of pride around us. Folks that have a need this morning will walk right out of this place from the very thing they have need of. We will walk right out of churches all over America today, all around this world today, because we have too much pride. We have too much pride. And far be it if somebody finds out something about us. And we'll walk right out on God today. But let me tell you, God's intention for your life is unmistakable. And his intention for your life is to save your soul and deliver you and set you free and heal you and cause you to be joyous, cause you to be blessed. You don't have to live like you came in this room. You can go away in a different way than what you came. 
Number three, and I'll finish. I got four more pages, but I feel like I need to stop here to be continued. Number three, God can work with what's left. The enemy is bent on destruction. God is bent on restoration. And God can work with what's left. Though our lives have been almost completely destroyed at times by the battering ram of life, there is no doubt about it, God can work with what's left. When an automobile has been in an accident, the place for the car is the body shop. Where's Brother Tim sitting back there in the back? When a car has been in a wreck, the place for it is the body shop. And I saw one body shop, the sign said above it, we fix wrecks. That should be the heart of every single church. I don't know many people that didn't come to Christ that they had not been wrecked at some point in their life. Sometimes ministries and churches only want the up and outers and they don't want to mess with the down and outers. Have you ever followed a car that was running down the road and it was kind of cockeyed? I've driven that car. The front's here and the other part's over here. You're just moving on down the road. Praise God, I was glad I had a car. You're driving down the road and you see that car in front of you. It's running down the road, cockeyed. Someone took the car to the wrong body shop, Brother Tim. When we see a person whose life is cockeyed and is running down the road cockeyed, we can be pretty confident that they have been fixed by the wrong source. But listen to me, if they stop by the altar, if you stop by the church, if you stop by the church where they realize that God fixed Rex and he's the God of what's left, I said he's the God of what's left, you may be walking crippled today, your finances may be crippled, your marriage may be in trouble, but listen today, you're in the place uh, where wrecks are fixed. Uh, I said you are in the place of all places today because he's the God of what's left. Skip. <laughs> Skip. When Lot chose, listen, I'm going to close here. I heard somebody say, yeah, right. <laughs> Was that you? They should have pulled all your teeth yesterday at the dentist. Please. When Lot chose the well-watered plains of Jordan, Abraham was consigned to what was left. What was left was a land that was not very productive. You with me? What was left was a land that was not very productive. Lot took the best land for himself. In spite of the fact that the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were located there. Listen to me, I'm closing. If you think that Lot didn't know what the risk were, you're wrong. Because the word said that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. For those that you read the Bible, you know where I'm headed. You know what I'm talking about. Don't think for a second that Lot didn't know what he was doing. The scripture said he pitched his tent towards the world. He turned his face and his family towards the world and turned his back on God. And here's the end result. The end result of Lot's decision was a total train wreck. The end result was a dead wife, a drinking problem, an incestuous relationship with his own daughter, and he became the father of two inbred nations called Moab and Ammon. Parents, Grandparents, church leaders, saints, listen to 
the heart of this pastor today. It doesn't pay to pitch your tent towards Sodom. I said it doesn't pay. What does pitching your tent towards Sodom look like? It looks like spending inferior amounts of time in the word and prayer. It looks like pursuing the riches at the expenses of our spiritual walk. It looks like allowing things into our homes that are not pleasing to the Lord. It looks like allowing our families to prioritize sports and education above the need to be connected to the local church. Pitching our tent towards Sodom looks like placing ministry on the shelf as we as we pursue as we pursue our careers and temporal successes. Some of us are here in this building this morning. Some of us that are watching around the world today will pay a great price for turning your tent towards Sodom. In case my warning against pitching your tent towards Sodom has come a little bit too late. I want you to know this morning that he's still the God of what's left. And this may not be for everybody in this room, but it's for several. We're here today. Some may be here and they're, they're watching around the world. They're sitting on church pews all over this world that are sitting there today just straight out of duty and not out of service. We've gone because somebody invited us. We've gone because we felt like we had to. Come on, I just praise God. I got to, I got to come to church today. I praise God they let me come to church today. Whew. Night, night before last, Friday night before the health fair, I didn't sleep a wink, man. I handed out groceries all night. I handed out school supplies. I made snow cones and I even cut hair. You can tell, right? I'm just heading some of you off. Because I was so excited to get to come to see what was going to happen. Last night, I couldn't hardly sleep. I preached all night. I changed sermons about 45 times and you may wish I'd have done it 46 because I was so excited to get here today to be with God's people and to see what God would do in this house today. He's the God of what's left. You may have walked in here, no joy, little money in the bank, on the last little mark on your gas tank on your car. Listen, all of those things, if all of those things were full today, that doesn't bring true happiness. He brings true happiness. Amen? Because I'm going to drive that car on down the road and it'll be back over there on E again. I've got to go through the same thing again. But with God, your tank never gets on empty. Somebody say amen. He's the God of what's left. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah. Would you bow your head with me all over this place? The church is praying. We have many guests in the room today. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are honored that you are here. We're honored that you've come today to be a part of our church family. My question is to you today, are you down to your last little bit of life? You've done everything you can do. You've thought through. You've, you've talked to everybody to talk to. And you're down to the end of it. I came here today to tell you he's the God of what's left. Some in the room, you need Jesus. You've got to make a decision today for Jesus. The scripture said that no man cometh to God except through the Holy Spirit. He's drawn by the Holy Spirit. So today is a divine setup. No, Pastor, I came today so my kids could be registered for the free bicycle. No, you came because God brought you here today to a point of decision. If Jesus comes before you get home, where do you go? Do you go to heaven or do you go to hell? 
Pastor, I'm all right. I didn't ask you if he was all right. I asked you, do you know? Because he's coming. I need to be saved today, Pastor. I want to make him Lord of my life. If that's you, raise your hand right where you are. I need a change in my life today. Thank you, sir. I see your hand. Somebody else. I, I, if Jesus comes, there, Pastor, there may be some things in my life that would keep me from making heaven today. And I want to make him Lord of my life. I want to give him all I've got left. If that's you, raise your hand right where you are. One guy's already raised his hand. Somebody else. Come on, the church is praying for lost, the lost in the room. Thank you, I see your hand. Somebody else. I need to be saved. I've got to make things right with God today. Just slip your hand up. We're going to pray for you. Raise your hand where I can see it. Sir, would you come? I see your hand. Would you come stand here with me? Would you come stand here with me? Here comes one. He's been bold enough. Somebody else, you'll come. Somebody else will come. I need some... I need some gentlemen that will come lead this man to the Lord. Would you give this gentleman a hand clap of praise today?